Hi, I'm Jenny Fish from One Big Happy Yarn Company. Welcome to our Big Check Felted Bag Knit Along. Have you ever accidentally tossed one of your precious knitted garments in the washing machine, only to find out it shrunk too small for even your fur baby? In this knit along, we're gonna tackle the art of felting with this fun and easy first time felting project. Using Cascade 220, which is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, we'll work a little intarsia to create a check pattern, then finish off by tossing it in the washing machine to let the magic of felting work for us. In this episode, we'll go over supplies, I'll show you how to organize your yarn, we'll work the front flap, back, and bottom of the bag, which is going to be a great start to this project. We have everything you need to knit with us at OneBigHappy.com. Let's get started. Let's talk about felting. Felting is where you take a knitted fabric from wool and you add hot water and agitation and the fibers come together and felt. They meld together, creating a more dense and structured fabric like we will use to make these bags. So this pattern has three different sizes. We have a small, a medium, and a really, really large one. So when you're picking your kit, be sure to pick which size you want because that'll have the right amount of yarn in it that you'll need for your project. So those are the three sizes that we have. We also have some other things that we need to use, which is a knitting needle, a US size nine for this project to get the gauge that I had. And um, this whole project is knit and garter stitch. So my gauge was about 20 stitches by 40 rows it gives you about four inches. Now the thing with felting is what you start out with is not what you end up with because your fibers are melding together. They're gonna shrink and your end gauge is gonna be completely different. And then also depending on how you felt it, your size could come out a little bit different than mine. So these are all approximate sizes as we go forward with this project because of the changes that felting causes when you're working with it. Some of the other things you'll be using is a yarn bobbin. This cute little thing, we're still working on it, but it'll be ready for you soon. And it might look just a little bit different, but I really like how we have this designed. So we'll be using the yarn bobbins, and then we'll also be using 100% Peruvian Highland wool that is in a hank, and it's twisted like this. You cannot knit from this. We have to turn it into a ball or a cake, something that looks like this. So let me show you how we do that. Have you ever wondered how this turns into this? Well, let me show you how. We do that by using an umbrella swift and a ball winder. So, this is the umbrella swift, and it gets its name because it looks like an umbrella when it opens up. The first step we wanna do is get it to approximately the size that we're gonna need, just a smidgen smaller. This little lever here comes up, and you tighten it by twisting it, and that'll hold it into place. Then we are going to take a look at our yarn. This is called a hank or a skein. Pop it open. And this is a delicate procedure here, people. We wanna make sure that we don't get it any, don't get it tangled. So I'm gonna open it up, take the label off, and I kinda of shake it out a little bit. Make sure all of my strands are going in the same direction as much as possible, and then we're going to slide it onto our Swift. Now I kind of do like half of it, then I'll turn it around, trying to keep all the strands going in the same direction. Pop it over here. Okay, so once we get it on here and I'm checking to make sure all my strands are going in the same direction, I'm gonna loosen this up by turning it towards me, sliding up, and that, that feels pretty comfortable to me. Then I'll lock it into place. Now I'm gonna, and see, look. Yay! Okay, now I'm looking for here. Here's where it's all tied together. I bring this side to me. Now on this one, it's just tied in a slip knot so I can pull it right out. Sometimes you will have to clip it. A couple other things too is sometimes there'll be three or four different times that it's tied together and that helps just keep the strands all together. This one only has one, so I only need to take it apart here. So this one had a slip knot and I went ahead and took that out and then I just kind of gently pulled that out. 
Now you'll have one that's behind your work and the other one that's in front of your work. It's always easy if you find the one that is working towards you. And then I'm gonna tuck this other one back here. Make sure that when you tuck this back here that it's not wound around any of your Swift pieces. You'll find out really quick if that happens. Okay, so I've pulled this out. Now I'm gonna come over here to my ball winder. This is my tension rod. Now I wanna make sure that it's opened all the way up as far as it'll go because this is gonna control the tension going into your ball winder and that's gonna determine how your machine winds your ball nice and neat. Okay, so it's got this little curly cue thing here. Wind it through there. Then it has these two slits right up here. We wanna lay our yarn through the two slits and put it down there. Now, I always like to keep a hand on my yarn that's coming from my Swift to my ball winder for a couple of different reasons. One, to kind of maintain the tension, make sure everything is flowing properly. And the other is I'll hit it. If there's a knot in my yarn, it'll hit my hand first. And then I can address that as I'm winding the ball. Okay, so your first two cranks of your ball winder, you wanna go a little slow. Make sure everything is seating properly on your ball winder. Now down here I've seen that the tail end has tucked under. I want to pull that up because I want that on the top of my ball. Don't want to lose that on the inside of my ball. And here we go. As I am winding over here, it is pulling from my Swift over here. Once I get several wraparounds, I can go a little faster. Always keep an eye on your tail. See how my tail is flinging up over here? I want to tuck this under but I wanna make sure that it doesn't get caught in any of my Swift pieces because if this gets loose, it can wrap around down here and then that just gets messy. Okay, so here we go. Keep an eye on that tail, it's being a little. slow down. If you ever do need to stop while you're winding your ball, just go a little bit slower till everything kind of stops. And I'm going to fix this one more time. I'm going to go up high because down low wasn't working this last time. Okay. All right. Now we'll go back, start off a little slow again, then get a little faster. This is also a great thing to let your kids help you with, with adult supervision, of course. But my littles, they like to wind and wind and wind until their arm gets tired, which is probably about like 30 seconds. But it's fun for them and they really do like to watch how the Swift works. It's entertainment too. The guys like to watch it too because it's mechanical. So you need to watch your speed as you're going along because if you get a little bit, if you get going a little bit too fast, <laughs> your ball might fly off the end of your ball winder. Maybe, <laughs> ask me how I know. <laughs> so kind of maintain a speed but not go super crazy. As I'm getting closer to the end of my skein, as you can see, there's less yarn on my ball, or on my Swift. So I kind of want to slow down a little bit because when it gets to that end, I want to maintain. And also too, by maintaining the speed, uh, the same speed, uh, your ball winds more consistently on your ball winder. So there we go. We can stop that now, drop it back down. Now, how do we get it off of here? Super simple because this tip is opened here. I just like to wind this around and then I like to tuck it under a couple of the strands on the outside. Um, make it where I can still see where it's at but this way it keeps it nice and neat. And then here is the beginning. If this ever does get sucked back down in, if you take your finger and hold it here and slide the ball uh, off, you can sometimes grab that when it comes in. If you can't, try not to fuss with it too much, just rewind it. Okay, so here we go. Slide my fingers underneath here, pop it off, there you go. You have a perfectly wound ball of yarn. 
So once you have all of your yarn wound into balls, now we're ready to start working the front flap section. But before we dive into that, I wanna talk about intarsia. That is where you're working blocks of color using a specific length of yarn or its own length of yarn. So instead of color work where you carry the yarn behind and you just keep going, this one, we have this section has its own yarn, this section has its own yarn, and all the way down the line. So to make that a little easier to deal with, we're going to put our yarn on a yarn bobbin. This will hold the yarn that we need for each section separately so that we're not dealing with all this transfer of yarn. It just makes everything a lot cleaner and smoother. So for this first section, what I did when I made my swatch is um, using two strands, this whole project you used two strands of yarn. So when I made my swatch for this first section, my gauge um, was about 20 stitches and 40 rows for four inches. Now gauge, I wanna talk a little bit about this because this is a felted project. Your gauge may be, once you felt it, it's gonna be completely different than what you start out with because when you felt, these fibers are compressing together so that totally changes everything. Um, this is two-stranded work. I like to wind my bobbin with two strands of yarn. In most cases, when you're doing two-stranded work, you wanna keep them from separate, pull them from separate balls to keep your attention. But because this is being felted, I'm not really worried about that. And I wanna keep my yarn more under control. So in this situation, I'm gonna wind each section onto a bobbin. Now I went through and I figured out how much yardage was in each one of these little squares so that I would know how much to put on my bobbin. And I figured out that it's a little less than seven yards. So by putting seven yards on each of my bobbins, I have the right amount of yarn for that section. An easy way to determine how much you need, how much yardage you need on your bobbin is there's 36 inches in a yard. So I pull out my tape measure and I know from here to here is one yard. So if I do this seven times, then I have seven yards worth of yarn. So I'll pull my two edges out and I just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I know to clip here. Now this will be a little extra, um, but you have a tail at the beginning and a tail at the end that'll use it all up and I'd, let, I'd rather have a little bit more than play yarn chicken at the end. So to wrap this around my bobbin, on here you'll see a number one with a slit. I just slide my yarn tails into there and then on the other side is a two. I'm just gonna wrap like this, get that all tucked in there. Then I turn it a little bit and I'll wrap from three to four and then just keep wrapping all the way around until I get all of this on my yarn bobbin. Another thing to think about too, when you're preparing your bobbin for your very first square, this is also gonna include your cast on. So what you might wanna do is add extra yardage of yarn to your first bobbin so you can just cast on and keep going. To figure out how much extra yardage, it's gonna depend on what size you're gonna be using because this pattern comes in three sizes. So take a look at your pattern, see how much it is. We are going to be using the long tail cast on. So to figure out how much yardage you're gonna need or how much yarn you're gonna need for your cast on, you can do the trick where you take your knitting needle and I was trying to find the tail, there we go. Take your knitting needle and you wrap your yarn around how many stitches you'll be casting on. And that gives you the starting point for your long tail cast on. Now, since you're gonna be taking that extra yardage and putting it onto your bobbin, double that because you'll have both sides of your cast on. And that's gonna give you extra yardage. You will have some left on your bobbin, but it'll be okay. It's better to have more than not enough. So go ahead and finish winding your bobbin and then we'll be ready to cast on. Okay, so we're using the long tail cast on. I'm just making a little sample here, so I'm gonna pull out a little bit here of what I need. Okay, to start, we're gonna make a slip knot. Slide that on our needle, make sure that the tail is facing your body, your bobbin is away from you. Go through. And 
cast on. And you'll follow however many for the size that you're making that you need to cast on, but continue going until you have those stitches cast on. So I know I went a little fast on this, but if you need some more help, we do have a video that you can click on that'll give you more details on how to do the long tail cast on. Now we're ready to start on row one. Now this whole project is worked in garter stitch. That means you knit every stitch, both on the right side and the wrong side. I'm using circular needles, but don't let that fool you. We're still knitting flat. You can use straight needles if you want to. It's whatever you prefer. So first thing I'm gonna do to make this first section is knit 10 stitches. There's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So now I'm done with the first section. I'm ready to start the next color. And the next color is a mix of one strand of the main color and one strand of the contrast color. So I've already made that bobbin here. I'm gonna pull off some yarn from that, and then I'm just gonna knit right into this next stitch and loop that around the needle and bring it through and start knitting. The yarn from the first bobbin, I'm just letting it hang there for right now. And then I'm gonna knit 10 stitches. Four, five. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. So now I'm ready for this last section and it uses a different color. So I'm going to grab my next bobbin and I do exactly what I did the last time. I'm going to pull out an extra yarn, make a loop, put my needle into that stitch to knit it, slide that loop around and pull my stitch through and then continue on. Let those hang there. So I've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now you'll go ahead and have um, however many for the pattern size that for the size that you're using, you'll cast on and you'll keep working back and forth between the first section of this pattern is going to be your main color and then a mix, main color all the way across. Just follow your pattern. Now I'm ready for row two. My yarn is still hanging here on my bobbin. These are in front of my work, like this. What I have found works for me is I just put them right here and pick up like this so that I have these in the back of my work and they're not in front next to my body. I let them hang out there. Now I'm going to just start knitting these first 10. One, whoopsie, there we go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So now we're ready to start this section. This is where we have our mix of the main and the contrast color. We just finished our 10 with this first color. I like to use the verbiage of old over new. It just helps me remember every time. We need to twist these two strands of yarn together so that we don't get a hole in our work. So that's very simple. You just take the color that you were using, the old color, lift it up and over the new color, and start knitting. And I like to kind of Hold them like this for a second, just for this first stitch to keep my tension the same for all my stitches. And then start knitting with this one. Let that one hang out where it is. We'll continue knitting these 10 stitches until we get to the next section. Now, every time you change from one to the other, be sure to do that same twist, old over new. Go the same way every time so that you don't create holes. It closes those up. Now, when you started the new color, there will be a little bit of a hole there. You can fix that real easy when you weave in your ends. Okay, so I'm almost here. And again, I'm gonna tug on this one because I want that tension of that stitch under here to match the one next to it. I'm ready to start the next bobbin. So I'm gonna take this old, place it over the new, 
bring in the new one, move it over here. It's like a crisscross. And you'll see them cross each other in the back. Make sure that you start out with this one, you know, because you're knitting, you always want your yarn in the back of your work. There's the new one, here's the old one. They crisscross right here. And I, for this first stitch, I hold them both like this just so I can make sure that tension is where it needs to be. Then just start knitting, I drop that one, and here we go. So that's row two. You'll continue going back and forth, switching your colors where you need to, until you have worked that first section, and that's 20 ridges. Remember when you're working with garter stitch, two rows make one ridge. So you've cast on 10 stitches, and then you want 10 ridges, which is 20 rows. Then we'll be ready to start the second section on the front flap. Okay, so once you've finished the first section of your front flap, it'll look something like this. A couple of things I've done here is I've gone ahead and clipped the yarn because I don't need those bobbins in this section anymore. And I've also placed a stitch marker on the right side of my fabric. And this is because of the way that the fabric rolls, sometimes it gets a little difficult to see which is the front and which is the back. So put that stitch marker on there so you know that this is the front of your work. And now I'm ready to start section two, and that is gonna start out with our one main, one contrast color bobbin. So I've got that ready here, and it's real simple. You just start knitting with it. Leave your tail just like you did before, wrap it around, and we'll knit. Now in these corners where these are matching up, like right in here, I'll show you when we get there, there'll be a little bit of a gap. But that's also where your tails are, so you can close those up when you weave in your ends. And because this is felted in the end, it all just melds together. You won't even be able to tell. Okay, so I'm knitting my first 10 stitches with this bobbin. Now the awesome part of this check pattern is because we have a solid, which is our main color, and then we're doing the two colors, one of each color, to mix it here. Um, when we get to this next section right here, we're doing the white all by itself. So two strands of the white. This is creating that fantastic check pattern or the gingham check or buffalo check, whatever you want to call it. But that's what's creating that look is by mixing the colors the way we are. So let me show you what this looks like on my sample here. We've finished the first section. We've started the first row of this section here. Now we're getting ready to go to the white. And this is what's giving us that fantastic check pattern. Okay, now I'm ready to start with the white. I'm gonna pull some out off of my bobbin here. Again, the same process. You're gonna leave a tail, loop it over the needle, and then just start knitting with it. You'll, clear, you'll close that hole up when you weave in your ends at the end. And just keep knitting. So go ahead and finish your front flap section according to the pattern for the size that you're making. And then meet me back here and we'll start the back section of our bag. Okay, so I've gone ahead and finished the section two of my uh, front flap of my bag. Go ahead and follow your pattern instructions for the size that you're making. But I wanna now show you how to make the back portion of the bag. And I'll show you on this sample that I have over here. Here is this flap right here. We're gonna just go straight into garter stitch and using two strands of the main color. So I'm gonna show you, it's very simple. I've gone ahead and clipped off my bobbins. I don't need those anymore. At this point, I can just start pulling from my balls of yarn, make sure two strands, and start knitting. I have this bobbin over here that already has some on there, so I'm just gonna start with this one for the sample. And we're going to just completely knit across each stitch all the way across. Now I do want to go over the back portion. And, the, and the, keep in mind the front portion is the exact reverse of the back portion, but you'll be working the back portion first. And I'm going to show you where that is in the bag. So I'm going to show you on this finish, this is the small version. And this is the front flap that we just finished knitting right here. Now we're going to start on the back portion right here. Um, we've already um, gone over putting a stitch marker here to indicate that this is the right side of our fabric. And you can see this crisp line right across here that's still working on the right side of our fabric. And we're picking up right here. Now, on each of these bags, there are different 
measurements for this section right here of the main color. And I'll show you that on this one too. See, this one is not as deep as this one. We've got that here. I designed these a little bit different to maintain our yarn control. So that way, in this bag, the medium sized bag, if you decide that you want to reverse your colors from the order that I've used, there's enough yarn here that you can do that. So by making this portion of the back flap a little bit chunkier or thicker, it allows you to have enough yarn to swap your colors out. On the small version, I just went ahead, I wanted that main color to be the main color. So that on this one, you'll still use just that main color. Okay, so we've worked this portion. Now we're gonna work this portion and you'll follow how many ridges and rows that you need. Once you've finished that main section, you'll just start off with the next color and it'll be two strands of the contrasting color. You'll work that through however many rows for the size that you're doing. And I'll show you here again on the sample. Once you get to that point, you'll see in the pattern that it indicates stitch markers. I have marked this on both sides of my work where the end of this back section is. And I'm leaving these in here because now we're gonna go on and work the bottom section. Because the colors are the same from the transition point, now this section right here is worked from, there to, from here to here. And that's why we have these markers here. And the reason for this is because our strap is gonna come all the way down to here. And I'll show you that construction when we go to seaming up the bag in the next episode. But I want you to be aware that this is where we wanna put our stitch markers in now so that we're prepared later on in our project. So once you have finished the bottom portion of the bag, join me in the next episode where we'll finish up the front, add the strap, and talk about felting. Remember, you can get a kit with the yarn and pattern at OneBigHappy.com. Be sure to hit the subscribe button below and click the bell to be notified every time we have a new video. Happy knitting and felting!